Thank you, Richard, and thank you, everyone, for um, bringing me here today and taking the time to learn a little bit more about research security and um, some of the wonderful updates that we have for all of you. Um, it's always hard for me to know how many people in the audience um, have an idea what research security is versus not. So I always just kind of want to start with this to level set. Um, this definition really comes out of um, the first US government policy document on research security, National Security Presidential Memorandum 33, that re was released in uh, 2021. Um, and research security is safeguarding the research enterprise against the misappropriation of research and development to the detriment of national or economic security, related violations of research integrity, and foreign government interference. Um, I think sometimes when we're talking about research security, it's still new for a lot of us and people don't know exactly what it means. And of course, coming from academia and various places, um, you know, in, in the um, in the uh, organizational kind of you know in the culture of openness, sometimes um, this can be kind of a scary thought or um, kind of policy. But um, I'm here today to kind of help you understand it, and then we're bring you up to date on everything that's happening um, because policy is moving quickly. Um, and I want to make sure that you guys feel empowered. Everyone has the information they need um, as we're moving forward. So this is a nice slide. I like it because it kind of breaks research security down by um, by actor. W what does this mean if you're a funder, research institution? And um, I'll focus on today for the researchers, since I think that is um, the vast majority of you in the audience. Um, as a researcher, it, me it means understanding the terms of any proposed affiliation or funding source, um, having that um, open communication with your home institution and also funding agency and then trying to kind of pre create a culture of research security um, within the lab or at your facility. So there are a number of um, moving policies. A lot has been happening over the past couple of months. Um, so NSPM 33 was um, published in January of 2021. That was followed by the implementation guidance where that definition of research security was established. Um, and these are some of the main activities uh, that, that have been happening in this area. We're seeking to um, have a harmonized disclosure policy. When I say disclosures, this means bringing forth your sources of funding, your jobs, any, any additional um, affiliations you may have, collaborations. And across agencies, this varies quite a bit. So one of the, one of the big deliverables in the implementation guidance was to have harmonization across agencies to make it easier for researchers. Um, so in February, uh, on February 14th, actually, uh, just uh, about a month and a half ago, Ago, the Office of Science and Technology Policy actually published a memo, Guidance for U.S. Government Agencies, um, requiring all agencies to develop an implementation plan um, to how they're going to uh, harmonize their disclosure policies. And that's specifically for the biographical sketch and the other um, uh, uh, current and pending other support. This will become effective for NSF in just a couple months. It's in the 2024 PAPG, so May 20th is when it becomes effective. Um, so that, uh, that harmonization is already going to be happening for NSF, and then other agencies will be close to follow. Now, I will say that um, in a perfect world, everybody will be perfectly aligned, but as we know, that is not always the case. What is the good news is that in this OSTP memo to all government agencies, uh, the research funding agencies, if any agency wants to diverge from on the harmonization of the disclosures. They need to provide a justification, the regulatory basis, the circumstances that require it, and that will actually have to go through an OMB approval process. So the bar will be very high about why any agency needs to diverge from that harmonized uh, disclosure policy. Um, another thing I want to mention is um, ORCID. This is something that um, uh, ORC ID or ORCID, however you prefer to uh, refer to this, this is something that NSF has been trying to join the ORCID consortium for a couple of years. We are finally in the process of doing so. This will hopefully um, minimize some of the administrative burden for many researchers right now. Um, the biographical sketch and other pending and current support is in Science CV. Once we implement um, ORCID, there will be a, a little bit more of a synchronization and that might uh, reduce the uh, administrative burden for all of you. Um, the really, really also another big one that is still in progress is the third bullet here, the Research Security Program Standards. This will be um, a requirement for institutions that are receiving uh, 50 million or more in funding from NSF over two consecutive years. 
Um, this is still in progress. Last year, probably if any of you um, came to this discussion last year, we had um, recently released the draft guidance that was published by OSTP in February of 2024. Um, we received overwhelming comments and that is still being adjudicated. We are working very closely with the Office of Science and Technology Policy to make sure that we're taking a risk-based approach. We do not want the research security program standards to be um, overwhelmingly burdensome. We want them to be really fit to, to the risk um, that we are all trying to mitigate. So um, this is still in progress. And then lastly, um, there's also going to be an effort to uh, harmonize oversight and enforcement. And um, this is still forthcoming. So lots of things happening for the Chips and Science Act. There are a number of research security provisions. I highlight the very first one because it's um, the research security training requirement for all covered personnel on federal awards. This will affect many of you. Um, the good news is um, this is actually something that we have been trying to help provide a resource to all of you in the community on. Um, through cooperative agreements, we have developed training modules this, that will satisfy this requirement. So the burden hopefully will not be on all of you. This is readily available. I'll go through this in much more depth. I think that is of large interest to many of you today. And this will become part of the 2025 PAPG. So this will not be required for yet a whole nother year, meant plenty of time to kind of get up to speed and such. And I'll, I'll go through that in a little bit more depth in a few slides. Um, also, the prohibition of the Malign Foreign Talent Recruitment Program. Um, for all federally funded researchers, this will become effective in the 2024 PAPG. So this is something um, that is you are going to have to be thinking about in just the next couple of months, and I'll walk through that um, in a little bit. Um, also, we are uh, making a lot of progress with standing up our secure center. This will be a huge resource um, for the community, trying to provide frameworks, information, services, um, building understanding. So I'll talk about that as well. And the last two here, I think, are a little bit less relevant. Um, but if anybody, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to touch on it. But I just want to make sure that we have time for Q and A at the end. It's just a reporting requirement for recipient institutions of higher education um, that they will have to be reporting uh, foreign financial transactions and gifts above fifty thousand dollars or more from countries of concern. So it's not at the researcher level. This is at um, the recipient um, institution of higher education level for NSF recipients. Um, so I don't think this will be affecting most of you, but if if anyone does have questions, happy to take them. And then we're also uh, working to um, uh, sync up with the Department of Defense with the prohibition of Confucius Institutes. Again, that's at the IHE level. Um, and there's a waiver program, but I, I don't think that is going to be as, as relevant. Um, so just a little bit more deeper dive into the standardized common disclosure forms. Again, really, we're trying to provide clarity to all of you. Um, disclosures, who discloses what, relevant, limitations, exclusions. Um, there has been a lot of confusion uh, across the community on this. So we're trying to harmonize it. Again, the disclosure process as well, what correction certifications need to happen, um, and really getting to that cross-agency uniformity. Again, this has been um, in train for quite some time, actually uh, shepherded largely by our head of policy at NSF, Jean Feldman. I'm sure many of you know her. She's phenomenal. She's been working very closely with NIH on this. And um, finally, as I said, um, these are available um, on our website, and this will become effective in a couple months in, uh, in May. Um, OK. so. Um, these are available, and so the training modules. Um, these are these were co-funded by not only NSF but also uh, NIH, Department of Energy, and Defense. Um, the, these uh, training modules have been developed through cooperative agreements by the community. Really, we didn't want this to be a U.S. government imposing exactly what, how this should be, what it should look like, et cetera. We wanted it to be coming from the community as much as we could. So four teams have developed these modules. Um, again, they were just published uh, about January 31st, so about a couple months ago now. Um, and again, this is available for everyone. There is no uh, limitation here. So researchers, stakeholders, academics, students, leaders, government, and even our international partners. There's actually been a lot of, lot of interest as well. Uh, the four modules cover four different areas. The first one would be, is very straightforward. What is research security? Getting a really deep dive into understanding why we're doing this. Why is this important? Why do we have to take the time? Why should we be thinking about it? Um, and what does it mean for you? 
Um, the second topic is the disclosures. This is really diving into the entire kind of core founding behind our research security policies that everybody needs to be forthcoming. Um, everybody should come to the table with their funding sources, commitments, because we want to make sure that everybody is playing fair, nothing is going to be misappropriated. And I would think as a researcher, this is of course your expectation anyway, that everybody should be honest and forthcoming. So it really dives into the disclosure policy. The third topic is how to manage and mitigate risk. Again, I think um, so often people think research security is contradictory to open science, et cetera, but that's not. They're mutually reinforcing. Uh, we want the ecosystem to be open and secure. The goal is to mitigate. If there's risk, we mitigate it. We see what we can do to still kind of um, you know, get to yes and get to an answer and a solution. And the last module I want to highlight is international collaboration. We want legitimate, wonderful international collaboration. We want the ecosystem to, to remain open. We just have to do it um, securely and have principled collaboration with values at the heart of it. Research security is there to try to ensure that we're all playing on the same playing field and no one is obfuscating um, and, and potentially um, has malintention. So these are on the website. Um, there are web-based versions. You can take them directly online. Um, the in Institutes of Higher Education can also download them for integration into the learning management system. There's a, a wonderful FAQs that were developed um, with the Foreign uh, Demonstration Partnership Research Security Subcommittee, which I'm a co-chair of. Um, you know, again, this is coming from the community. What are questions? What would be helpful? So we have a long list of frequently asked questions. Here are a few of them about how to kind of integrate them into the uh, into the your already program office training. Um, again, uh, they're about 30 to 60 minutes per module, um, really interactive. We've tried to not make them boring. Um, I, don't, I know no one really uh, runs to go take a training, um, but again, these are so valuable. They're so, they're gonna equip with you, equip you and help you understand um, the larger context and how, and how to ensure that your research is secure. Um, and actually, as my boss likes to say, uh, Dr. Rebecca Kaiser, if you can um, binge watch a Netflix show for four hours, you can definitely do this. So <laughs> I think, unfortunately, many of us could probably say we have done that in the past. <laughs> Um, so this is, again, I wanted to kind of walk through this a little bit more in depth. Um, the Malign Foreign Government Talent Program, um, this is a requirement in Chips and Science. This is becoming effective on May 20th in the 2024 PAPG. And this means that all PIs, co-PIs, and senior personnel, um, as well as institutes of higher education, are going to have to certify um, that uh, that no, none of the key personnel are involved in a foreign, uh, malign foreign talent program. What this means, all of those bullets right in front of you on this slide, these are all the actions that describe what it would mean to be in a foreign talent program. And what pairs these actions to make it malign by definition in the Chips and Science Act is if it is being directed and sponsored by a country of concern. Um, that has been identified in legislation um, as uh, the People's Republic of China, the Russian Federation, Iran, and North Korea. There was a lot of back and forth on this. Um, There's a lot of attention. I mean, I think as research security really started happening, um, foreign government talent recruitment programs were a big part of it, trying to um, kind of gain the competitive edge, take, take our data, take technology. So really, um, at this point in time, this is, this is one aspect that the government has decided that it just it needs to be prohibited. So um, again, I think any of these actions, probably any of you would say that just doesn't sound right. I wouldn't want to be partaking in this, and I don't think any of the research is in my lab should also be partaking in this. Again, unauthorized transfer of intellectual property, non-public information, um, establishing a laboratory in a foreign country in violation of terms and conditions of a research award, um, again, overcapacity, mandatory to obtain research funding from foreign government entities, omitting acknowledgement of home institution, not disclosing program participation. I mean, I think these are all very straightforward, but i um, happy to kind of field any questions because we have definitely received a fair amount of questions from the public on this one, and there is still a lot of discussion. So I want to be able to provide clarity um, wherever it is needed. Uh, really quickly, just want to highlight, again, this is um, the wonderful open source center that we're going to be standing up soon through a cooperative agreement. In the Chips and Science um, Act, it is called uh, the Research Security Integrity Information Sharing Analysis Organization, which is a mouthful. So we have um, renamed it the Secure Center, um, safeguarding the entire community and the U.S. research ecosystem. 
We acknowledge that um, the landscape is changing and currently the geopolitical environment is, is very challenging for research. Um, we're trying to provide clarity as quickly and as much as we possibly can. Um, we also know that I think, um, again, the, there has been a historic organizational culture kind of clash between researchers, institutions, universities, faculty, and um, some US government agencies. Specifically, you know, we have heard this when the law enforcement community and uh, national security community first started outreaching academia, it was very confusing. I think there was a lack of, um, you know, kind of understanding between these two. So we're really hoping that the Secure Center is going to help bridge um, this divide. And again, this is going to be providing a ton of resources. You can see here the mission. Um, the goal is really to empower. We want to empower the community, all of you, to be making these security informed decisions. Um, the approach, we want to provide information, but we also want to, you know, not only just give you the fish, but teach you how to fish. We want to make sure that you have the tools that you need to make these decisions. Um, you know, answer questions where you don't understand the significance of this for you, how this affects you, what is risk, what is risk for you at the researcher level, what does that mean for your institution, um, and beyond that. Um, and then really the audience, uh, again, this is institutes of higher education, nonprofit research institutes, and small, medium-sized businesses, among, among others. Um, a couple things I just want to highlight. Again, I think um, across the board, there's different levels of resources. So we, we do strive to provide uniform quality of uh, service, hoping this will reduce uh, administrative burden, providing these frameworks, syntheses, patterns of risk, providing analytical tools to empower um, uh, all of you in the community. And what the Secure Center will not be doing is be providing decisions, advice, and co conducting investigations, or making policy. So it has been a very long road. <laughs> Solicitation was last August. We just completed the panel review, the Blue Ribbon panel review last month, um, planning to recommend an award, um, hopefully in just a couple months, and then really um, making that award in late summer. Um, so then uh, the Secure Center will be standing up. Um, we are hope hopefully having a lot of immediate deliverables mm -hmm. that the Secure Center can be offering to the community right away. And of course, um, that'll be building up over time. One other thing I do want to mention to all of you is a forthcoming uh, policy that we do have at NSF and then a, a rubric uh, to support that process. Um, NSF is now in the 2024 PAPG, so in a couple months, it will be able to review national, uh, uh, NSF proposals for national security reasons. Um, this has been a trend. I mean, again, this is in the Chips and Science Act. This has been a trend across the board. Many of you may have seen the Department of Defense's decision matrix. Um, in addition, DARPA, Army, many others have had existing matrices that they've used uh, for these same reasons to evaluate risk in proposals. Um, also, NIST has published published recently, just a few months back, a long, about 100-page document, their 8484 on mitigating risk as well. And the goal, again, here, let's mitigate. Let's mitigate the risk. I mean, the, the, um, the signaling is clear <laughs> that um, the Hill, Congress, the, we have to move forward. We have to make these decisions. We have to develop a process to evaluate proposals. Now, NSF receives over 40,000 proposals a year. This is not going to be the easiest of undertakings. We're going to take a very limited scoped approach. Um, we are developing a rubric of potential risk-based indicators to inform our basis of thinking. Um, but we even may, um, we actually may pivot even away from that. We're trying to um, solicit input. We're taking a number of actions across the board to make sure that we're bringing in everybody um, not only from stakeholders, internal, across NSF staff, all the directorates. Um, the Jason are a group of uh, really uh, phenomenal uh, scientists who understand um, uh, the nexus with national security issues. We have uh, commissioned two recent reports with them, one on uh, sensitive technology specifically. This was kind of a continuation of the 2019 report that, we, that the Jason did for us that really helped inform our thinking for research security. Um, and the findings from this um, were very helpful because, of course, the identification of sensitive technology, which is required in two legislative requirements for NSF, um, is something that we do have to be thinking about. But what does that mean? What does that mean in basic research? And the Jason recommended not using a list that we need to be more dynamic, we should be taking a project level approach, be including the PI in the discussion, among many others. 
We're also doing a STIPI study, um, a Jason Winter study to road test the rubric that we had. We just got the results back and they had a lot of wonderful insight for us. The Jason study um, on safeguarding the research enterprise, which focuses on sensitive technology, the first bullet that is public, that was just published last week. On um, this third bullet, the Jason Winter study, road testing our rubric, that is an internal document, just so you are aware. So um, we got a really, we got a phen phenomenal amount of feedback because some of the criteria that we're thinking about are the maturity of the technology. How do we take that into consideration? And there's challenges um, with that question and what is TRL? And some people don't know what TRL is and does NSF need to be thinking about TRL? So this, there's a lot of questions that we're trying to answer and figure out how, how do we make that decision? And also I, acknowledging the uniqueness of NSF. NSF really is about, you know, it's researcher driven. Let's, let's answer these questions. It's different than DOD and DOE that are very mission driven, mission centric. And in that, in that context, how, how can NSF be, um, you know, evaluating potential risks and mitigating those risks um, differently um, than DOD and DOE? So we're working with the interagency, NSF staff, and then once we get to a place where we have something that we can share with the public, we are gonna be doing external consultations. Okay, so this is the foreign financial disclosure reporting requirement. I think I will not go into it if you want to save time for questions or I can touch on it quickly. I just kind of turn it over to you. Does anybody have questions or areas that you wanted me to dive into a little bit deeper? Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, great. Uh, hey, so you mentioned the Jason study on sensitive technology. Can mm -hmm. you define sensitive technology? Yeah, sure. Well, um, the Jason is making a distinction between highly sensitive and sensitive technology in, in, in the report um, that is really kind of um, still be, I mean, it's, it's a very actually nuanced uh, question. Um, I don't think they came out with an actual definition of it. It's more about um, the process um, to get there. And again, working at the project level between the PI, the program officer, not going by a list of sensitive technologies. I'm sure as you're aware, OSTP has critical technology lists in addition to DOD among any many other agencies. So their suggestion is not to go by the list, but at the project level, taking that dynamic approach working with the PI, program officer, and ascertaining what are the potential national and economic security implications, and then them making that determination. It's more about a process rather than, yeah. Does that help you? Yes, I know. Well, and it's, it's, it's a great point. And um, we actually haven't responded yet. We are going to be responding to all the Jason recommendations um, right now. I think, um, you know, I think it's an ideal to strive towards. There are inherent um, problems with lists and, and, and sub lists, right, of su sub technology areas. However, in a real world, yes, what is the bandwidth? What is the resource intensive process to really be making that determination? At the moment, how we're thinking about looking at this is, again, over 40,000 40, proposals a year, we're not gonna be able to look at everyone. So we are looking at the key technology areas that are identified in the Chips and Science Act. Obviously, QIST, quantum information science technology, AI, microelectronics, biotechnology, among many others. We are, gonna do, we are gonna roll this out in a pilot. It will be a very limited rollout because we want to make sure we are not um, deploying a policy that has not been tested. We expect this to be an iterative process. Um, we are thinking in the beginning, um, it, what we're gonna, the, most likely the approach that we're gonna be taking um, for quantum information science technology proposals at this first stage, at the for, that's what we're planning to do for a pilot, is we're working with our subject matter experts within NSF to identify potential keywords. What is really the holy grail? What is, what is the most critical aspect for quantum? We can't look at everything. There is always gonna be a potential groundbreaking, breaking, um, you know, research that could change the world. But at the end of the day, if something is really not anticipated, if there's not indicators there, you know, we, we really have to take a little bit more of, um, of a, a measured approach, I guess we should say. So we're planning on using some keywords specifically at that first level of kind of scoping down, right, to get to a, a much smaller, smaller set of proposals. And then um, along with additional criteria, again, we're potentially considering um, the maturity of the technology. Again, that's very subjective, it's challenging. Where does that onus go? Should it be on the PI? 
Should it be on the program officer? Will that ultimately, would that requ require a change in the PAPG down the road? You know, there's there's a lot of, um, in an ideal world, we'd like to take that criterion into, into um, consideration, but the implementation of how we do it and how resource intensive it's gonna be and how subjective it's gonna be, these are all questions that we're working through right now. Um, and then in addition, of course, um, you know, the other criterion that we are considering is of course the current research security policy. We wanna make sure that everyone is being forthcoming and honest. So if there are, if there is an undisclosed affiliation funding that will be taken into consideration as it normally does already. Um, but then again, we work through that. Was it a mistake? What happened? We work with the Institute of Higher Education, um, where that PI is from, and try to work through that. Now, I think there's a, it, you know, I think it's, again, it's a little bit of a you know, there's no black and white here. You really have to, it's a little bit more nuanced because people make mistakes. Sometimes people don't disclose something. We want to definitely discern between the mistake and the winning obfuscation of affiliations. Um, and then another, the other criterion that we're really um, considering is trying to scope this as much as we possibly can. We want researchers, everyone to feel like they can move forward with international collaboration, work with researchers around the world, the brightest minds. We do not want to impede that in any way. So we're looking specifically at trying to consider affiliations with Pro proscribed parties. These are essentially, there's numerous US government lists that are um, published by the Departments of Commerce, Treasury, State Department, Department of Defense, the 1286 list, specific um, entities that are involved in, in, in activities contrary to US national security interests or human rights abuses for a variety of reasons. So we are trying to take a more fine scalpel approach and again, DOD's matrix does this. Um, they specifically call out the 1286 list, the BIS entity list, um, in addition to other um, uh, military-related uh, um, entities. So we're trying to take that approach to say, okay, if, if, one of, if a PI has an affiliation with an entity that we know is acting contrary to our national security interests, we have to take it into consideration, and we'll take a look at that, but again, what does that mean? Maybe we can ask that PI to stop that cooperation or we can, we can get to a solution. Again, it's very nuanced, right? Um, <laughs> there's two sides of the spectrum. We're trying to get to the middle because of course somebody from a national security perspective will say, you shouldn't do it. But somebody in academia will say, okay, but this is something they worked on and they weren't working in this specific area. Maybe they had an affiliation with a proscribed party, but it was in a different department, you know, working on chemistry rather that, you know, so, so we're gonna be taking all of that into consideration. So the goal really is using keywords, trying to scope down, and then really when there is a risk, then looking at that project level only on a much, much, much smaller number of proposals to really try to ascertain what is the potential national security risk of this technology. Long answer, but that's, it's kind of a long process and this is what we're working through, so. <laughs> okay, great. Um, any other questions? Sorry, it's like a heavy topic for a Friday morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> but again, um, I, just, I just really do want to foot stomp that what we're hearing from the community is the geopolitical climate is really challenging and there's a chilling effect. People are saying no to legitimate cooperation with researchers from specific countries and that is not what we want. We need, we, the reason, just as critical to US national security as the Jason has said and said in the 2019 report and reinforced in this just recent report is our ability to attract the brightest minds and the brightest talent and, and foster international collaboration and bring the brightest minds together into this country is, is just is critical to our national security. So I just want to foot stomp that. Um, and great, we have one last question. Wonderful. Well, first, thanks for this overview. And you've got a heavy burden later. <laughs> um, it does feel like this is a national security issue that's flowing all the way down to the PIs, but it also will flow through the institutions, flow through the centers. I read a couple of weeks ago that Stanford had gotten caught up in one of these things and was fined several million dollars, if I re uh, recall correctly. Some of your FFRDCs and their managing organizations would be wiped out by a fine at that level. So how do we protect the groups that are operating your national laboratories from the financial risks associated with something that one of their researchers might do that they don't necessarily have 
the ability to limit and control. I wonder if you could comment uh, on that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, I can't speak for the Office of Inspector General or law enforcement agencies specifically, but what I can say is education, awareness, understanding of where there are potential research security risks, thinking about how to mitigate those risks, you know, asking for all the researchers knowing the, the affiliations, the commitments, conflicts of commitment and interest um, and, and affiliations of the uh, researchers and senior key personnel um, working within those FFRDCs. So, I mean, these were, I think that we can get there. I think there's a lot of information that we can, you know, specifically make sure that, you know, if the education and the mindset starts changing, again, the circumstances are always very, very case specific. And I would imagine that in a case where, you know, an institution like, in the, as you as you referenced, is getting fined that much, I think it was potentially a more, you know, a, a systemic problem, right? I mean, I think a one-off, a mistake, missing one senior key personnel's affiliation is one thing, um, but the circumstances matter. But I think the more information we can get to all of you, the clarity that we can provide um, is going to mitigate that risk. And I think law enforcement agencies, you know, always take that into consideration, right? Making that. But yeah, go ahead. The risks are high enough that they're going to take a very conservative approach. And I'm already mm. seeing that. I'm already being asked about mm. people in countries that are adjacent to the proscribed countries, you know, former Soviet Union countries that are not actually Russia, but are next door. So I just think they're going to be very, very cautious and that's gonna be complicated for us to manage because of the financial yeah. risks. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I mean, I would love to kind of um, talk a little bit more offline about this because we should right. be getting the, you all the information that you need so you're not taking such a conservative approach because if that's gonna stifle good cooperation and getting to the best you know, research results that we can get, then we, then we don't want that. So we want to we want to get you guys to yes where we can. So let's I'll give you my card and we can definitely great. talk offline. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you.